Welcome to the Clayton Tyner Podcast, where I help you view current issues through the ancient wisdom of scripture. This week, comedian Cat Williams once again went viral, this time on the Joe Rogan Experience. While discussing a wide range of topics, Cat jumped into an impromptu apologetic, laying out a compelling case for the existence of God. While his delivery may be unorthodox, the case he makes is something many believers could learn from. The blockbuster sequel to the sci-fi epic Dune released this weekend to massive critical acclaim. The movie is imbued with political, social, and religious themes that are being discussed far and wide. However, the plot begs for one conversation that I have not heard many people having. A key character in this chapter of the saga is a fetus in the earliest stages of development, which made me wonder, did Dune accidentally make the most pro-life movie of the year? MSNBC star Joy Reid attracted mixed reviews after a TikTok rant questioning why some people are pushing couples to have more children. In the now infamous video, Reid remarked, the United States has a population north of 327 million people. Why do we need more kids? Many people think like this, so we will seek to answer that question with both ancient wisdom and modern day facts. All that and one look at the controversy surrounding IVF. After Alabama's ruling stating that embryos created through the process of in vitro fertilization are in fact human life and must be protected, a heated conversation has emerged over the ethics of the process. We will think carefully through both the facts and the feelings surrounding this dilemma and try to figure out how a Christian should navigate this delicate topic. All that and more on episode 52 of the Clayton Tyner podcast. All right, we made it to episode 52. I want to thank everyone for rocking with me, for commenting, liking, sharing, and most of all, for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, come on over to youtube.com slash Clayton Tyner. If you're an audio only listener, do me a solid, come over to youtube.com slash Clayton Tyner, trying to get that subscriber count up. We're in the 900s, which means there's only one thing left to do. We got to put a comma in it, right? Let's get to a thousand. That will be an exciting milestone. Also, if you want access to exclusive content, content, early access to some content. I'm about to post an interview video that you'll get like early, early access to if you are a Patreon. Also, monthly live Q&As. Check out patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. This is a way for you to help support the work that I'm doing on the podcast, taking biblical truths and applying them to modern day issues, things going on in the news. If you're new to the channel, that, that's what we do here. We look at current events through the lens of the ancient wisdom of scripture and try to have a biblically informed worldview, which means if you are a believer, I hope this gives you some things to wrestle through. And if you are not a believer that maybe this will give you a glimpse into what a Christian worldview would actually inspire in your life. So without further ado, let's get into our first three points. Cat Williams absolutely lit the internet on fire when he went on Shannon Sharp's podcast just a few weeks ago. During that podcast, he actually name dropped Joe Rogan and several other comedians. Joe responded by saying he, he's never met Cat. He loves his stand up. He would love to have him on the podcast. And lo and behold, on Rogan's first podcast back on YouTube with his new Spotify deal, he opens it up with a three and a half hour conversation with. Cat Williams. So these two comedians went across a wide range of topics. And let me make it very clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I fully understand Cat Williams theology. I'm not claiming he is like a born again evangelical Christian. I'm not saying that the God he believes in is necessarily even the God of the Christian scriptures. What I am saying is that 13 minutes into this podcast, kind of impromptu, Cat Williams jumped into what we would call an apologetic defense for theism. Now, theism is the belief in God. It's contrasted with atheism, which is the absence of belief in God, or historically believing there is no God. And Cat Williams just says, he kind of takes it for granted that it's obvious that God does exist. And he goes into an apologetic that has existed for a very, very long time. He just puts it in his own comedic Cat Williams style spin. And so let's look at this interaction between him and Joe Rogan. 
the fact that there is a God is the biggest conversation worldwide. But the truth of the matter is, there is more reason for you to believe there is a God than there is for you to not. So this is like his thesis, right? He's going to walk into his apologetic, but he makes this claim up front. There's far more reason to believe in God than there is reason to not believe in God. And this is what apologetics does. It just gives a defense of the faith that you have. Again, I don't know which God he's exactly pointing to, but the existence of God, that's the top layer, which is just theism, is going to be proved out by him going through what we would actually call the teleological argument for the existence of God. And he's going to do it in a very beautiful Cat Williams way. Like the way that things interact, like if we're just talking about marijuana or alcohol or whatever that is. Wow. You have to understand that this thing serves no other purpose than to bring pleasure to this small group of beings. Right. And the fact that it already was set up to do that, the fact that it was already set up on this planet for there to be medicines for us to find and mm. to utilize. And yeah. you see what I'm saying? It's yeah. like, it's not like, oh, yeah, so he made a cow. No, to make a cow, it means you had to also have made grass. And it means you would have had to have invented a whole new eating system for this animal, which was cud. And that means you would you would then have to have given him three stomachs to be able to, and you would have to have known that he was gonna then emit a gas that was gonna be necessary and on the planet. Like, mm, yeah. like none of these things. Fertilizer, are, all of are, it. Right, the Seeds. fact that everything goes together is mm -hmm. how you know. It's pretty the fact that everything goes together is how you know. That is a summation of teleology. This is the argument from design. The word telos just means design or purpose. And he didn't lay out a careful three-point syllogism, and you probably wouldn't either, in just the flow of conversation with a friend. However, uh, in First Peter, he tells the, the church in your hearts, re regard Christ the Lord as holy, and be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Anyone who asks you for a reason. What does he say at the very beginning? Here's his thesis, Cat Williams' thesis for the existence of God. There's far more reason to believe there is a God than there are reasons to believe there are not. And he starts a little bit shaky, right? He's talking about marijuana and alcohol and how those things are here just to kind of give these, you know, people who inhabit the earth pleasure. Uh, but then he goes further. And the best part of his illustration is saying, consider the cow. You know, C.S. Lewis might say, consider the cow. And then he goes into it's like, he, he didn't just make a cow. Uh, to make a cow, the cow's got to have grass. And there has to be a certain kind of food. And to digest that food, it has to have three stomachs. And it emits a gas that is necessary for the, the sustaining of life on the planet that the cow is on. He's just going to a deeper and deeper layer of design, a layer of purpose. And there's a great argument for the existence of God out of design. And he, he barely scratched the surface on it, but he does make a great conclusive statement. He says, when you just view the world and how it all fits and forms together, that's how you know. A little bit earlier in the interview, he says, you know, coming up on planet Earth and thinking that it's there by mistake is like driving into Beverly Hills and wondering if someone designed that city for people to live in. And so what is the teleological argument for the existence of God? You can put this logically into a three-step syllogism. And a syllogism says, if premise A is correct, and premise B is correct and follows from A, then conclusion C must be valid. It's, it's a way to create an airtight argument. And so this would be the three-point syllogism. Number one, if every design has a designer, and number two, if the universe has a highly complex design, then the conclusion, then the universe has a designer. One more time, if every design has a designer, and if the universe has a highly complex design, then the universe has a designer. And we know this. We know that things that are intentionally designed at a level of complexity have designers to them. Uh, if you got a encyclopedia, thousands and thousands and thousands of words 
hundreds and hundreds of pages bound in leather, uh, bound with a spine across the book to hold the pages together. If, if you saw an encyclopedia, you were out on a hike and there was just one out in the woods, you would never in your entire life even have the thought that that spontaneously arrived there out of nowhere. Because you know that things that are designed, especially in a highly complex manner, have a designer. And so to believe anything else, what Cat Williams is saying and what the teleological argument is saying is ludicrous. Every design has a designer and we know the universe and the life inside the universe has a highly complex design. I'll go through just a few of the arguments that are made for the highly complex design of the universe. If the expansion rate of the universe was different by one part in a thousand million million, one part in a thousand million million, a second after the Big Bang, the universe would have collapsed back in on itself. If you spread a tape measure across the known universe to represent the gravitational force and it changed on that scale by just one inch, the universe would either expand into its heat death or collapse back in on itself. This is not like arguments coming out of the Christian quarter. These are facts given to you by Stephen Hawking and other atheist uh, uh, physicists and scientists. When we look at life, the simplest single cell amoeba, not the super complex human life, the simplest single cell amoeba, amoeba has 1,000 30 volume Encyclopedia Britannica's worth of DNA information in it. Remember what we said. If you tripped in the woods on a hike over one volume of an encyclopedia, you would never, ever, you wouldn't be able to fathom the thought that that just created itself somehow, that it just sprung into existence. And yet the simplest single cell organism has the equivalent of 1,000 30 volume encyclopedias worth of DNA information in it. DNA is a language. It, it is an alphabet. It is highly complex and it is the, the instructions, the code of all life. And how did that happen? Well, if every design has a designer and the universe and life have a highly complex design, then the universe itself has a designer. And this is what Kat is saying. If you just look around, the way everything comes together, that's how you know. Look at a cow, man. You can't just say, oh, he, he, was, he made a cow. Very impressive. Look at the causal chain of events. Everything connected just to a cow's existence. L look at the fine tuning. L if you really look at the fine tuning argument from God for, for God and you look at the myriad of things that had to happen in order for our universe to exist and to sustain life, then it just becomes kind of obvious something or someone is holding all of this together. Remember what Peter said, in your hearts reg regard Christ the Lord as holy, be ready at any time to give a defense for anyone who asks you for a reason that the hope is in you. And Cat Williams was able to do that with Joe Rogan, who, by the way, kind of famously when he was younger, was a very outspoken agnostic. And Kat just goes right at it and says, the fact that there is a God is the conversation that everybody should be having. And if you are a believer, the question is, are you ready to have that conversation with the people in your life? Dune chapter two opened this weekend, brought in almost $200 million in its first weekend at the box office. People are going wild for this movie. It is critically acclaimed. Everyone seems to love it. It's got a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes and a 95% audience score. Very, very difficult to do. Stunning visuals, a compelling storyline, just some of the best world building that has happened in a very, very long time. and. Inside of this sci-fi saga, there are deep political themes, deep social themes, as well as deep religious themes. And you can see people dissecting these themes and having debates and arguments and conversations over what they mean and what they might be signaling to us in our world today. And that's what a great work of art does. It, it has lots of interpretive layers that you can dig into, and people will divide over the interpretation 
combination of those themes and have healthy dialogue. And of course, on the business side, this is just great for the movie because it churns out more and more conversation when you don't force feed your audience the political and social narratives that you're trying to get across. And instead, you have a multi-layered saga that allows people to dig in and extrapolate out their own interpretations. However, f- from from the conversations happening, there seems to be an obvious theme in the movie that is sorely lacking from the discourse around those political, social, and religious themes, and that is the issue of life. You see, one of the primary characters is a fetus in the very earliest stages of development. Screen Rant, ahead of the movie releasing, put out this character description. Ahead of the movie's theatrical release, the first description of Aaliyah's role has seemingly surfaced, referring to an embryo who advises her mother from the womb, an embryo who advises her mother from the womb. So in Dune chapter one, we realize that the mother is in fact pregnant. And now this embryo, this fetus, might even call it a baby, is playing this star role. And the question is like, how does the culture actually think about babies in the womb? Because if you just watch Dune 2, Dune 2 may accidentally be the most pro-life movie ever created like the star character and the person who they're actually having forward facing visions of this person as a young woman and is a key figure guiding the entire narrative and helping to shape the actions of the characters on screen it is just this tiny tiny embryo as a matter of fact they go so far as to even show images of this little girl in utero, as she is advising and communicating and involved in visions. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can see this right now. I mean, this is early, early in the embryonic development, right? And yet it is ascribed consciousness and it is shown visions. We are shown visions of the future of who this will be in this saga, and I didn't read the Dune novels, and so um, I don't have all of that level of sci-fi scoop, right? Um, I'm kind of like a a a, a nerd novice in some ways. Um, so you might you might have read all of Dune, and you can tell me in the comments everything I'm wrong about here. What I'm not wrong about is they were putting what we call a fetus, an embryo, pretty close to a zygote, up on screen and communicating with it and casting vision for the future of its life. Wow. And that in a society and a culture, and especially the Hollywood culture and the influencer culture who pushes a pro-choice agenda all of the time, which says that's not really a, a child. I mean, it's human, but it, it, it's not like, it doesn't have dignity or worth yet. And really, if, if someone wants to end that life, then that's their prerogative. And so how does culture actually feel about babies in the womb? Because you see a movie like this and it's like, man, that's gotta be protected at all costs. Like, we're like having this communication. We're seeing visions of like, you know, when, when it looks, when it looks like a fetus, when it looks like these are the literal pictures pro-choice people show you to be like, tell me that looks like a baby. Like that. I mean, that, that could be anything that could be a mole rat. That could be a lemur. That could be a baby crocodile. Like, tell me why that matters. Right. That's the exact picture, but they're showing it and communicating with this baby girl. And so the same culture that shows those pictures to say, listen, I mean, if it's inconvenient or it's going to hurt your future or you're just not ready, you know, you can have that abortion and that's not a very big deal. But when it's culturally convenient, then the broader society will celebrate babies in the womb. And so I, I'm not an investigative journalist, okay? This was just like four minutes of digging. And I found two articles from the same publication, which is Us Weekly. And they tell opposite stories on the cultural narrative about how we feel with babies in the womb. And so here is the first one, celebrity pregnancy announcements of 2023. See which stars are expecting babies. Expecting what? Oh, expecting babies. Also the thing in the womb, that's, that is a baby. 
they're going to have a baby. And so that's a life and the life is going to mature. And we're all very excited about it. And a celebrity that wants to keep their baby gets pregnant. And we're just like, what's the name going to be? And is it going to look more like the mom or the dad? And when's the due date? And are they going to bring the baby to the red carpet? And we're all excited about it. We'll look at a little bit of this. Hollywood stars, including Brody Jenner and Logic announced in 2023, they were expanding their families. Oh, so the thing in the womb is a part of the family? Already by welcoming new babies. Jenner shared on January 1st that his now fiance, Tia Blanco, was pregnant with their first child. To start off this new year, we'd like to take this opportunity to wish all our friends, family, and followers health, happiness, and an abundance of love. Jenner and the pro surfer captioned a joint Instagram video of Blanco getting a sonogram. We truly appreciate and love you all. We are excited to share with you the blessing of a new life in the new year. And so this goes through, scroll down to see all of the pregnancies. So this is, this is it. We're so excited. These are babies that are part of the family. They have a life. They have value and they're bringing value to our family. That's Us Weekly, right? Okay. Now, Us Weekly. Celebrities share their abortion stories. Uh, Laura Prepon, Cheryl Burke, Kiki Palmer, and more. Plenty of celebrities, both those with and without children, have opened up about having abortions over the years. After the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, tons of stars took social media to express their outrage. Cheryl Burke revealed that she had one when she was 18 years old, adding that she was saddened by the court's decision to overturn Roe. If it wasn't for places like Planned Parenthood, I would be a mother. That's I mean, terrible, obviously, being a mother. That's the worst. And I wouldn't have been a great mother, and I definitely wouldn't be sitting here today, the Dancing with the Stars pro said in an Instagram video. Uma Thurman detailed her abortion story in September 2021 after Texas passed a law banning the procedure after six weeks. In my late teens, I was accidentally impregnated by a much older man, the Pulp Fiction actress wrote in an essay for the Washington Post. I wanted to keep the baby, but how? After discussing it with her parents, however, the Oscar nominee realized that terminating the preg pregnancy was the better choice. Choosing not to keep that early pregnancy allowed me to grow up and become the mother I wanted and needed to be. So the baby had to die, but I, I, I'm now really thriving and super famous, and I got to grow up and be a mother to kids that I wanted. One more, Joan Collins. In her October 2023 memoir, Behind the Shoulder Pads, Collins revealed she had an abortion in her 20s while she was engaged to Warren Beatty. I was lucky to have had an expert doctor. I had no pain and recovered within two days and was able to get on with my life. Wow. This may make me sound callous, but I just thought of the episode as a delayed period and put it on the back of my mind. The scenario of what my future life would have been like if I had gone to term and delivered a child was too depressing. I would have been vilified by the press. So it might sound callous, but this is just what I had to do to take care of me. And that is the cultural narrative. And so how does the culture actually feel about babies in the womb? Well, it depends on the situation. If the couple is happy and wants to keep their pregnancy, then we call it a baby and we're super excited about it and we welcome it with open arms and we have all these anticipations of baby names and what it's going to look like and when's the first time we're going to get to see photos of it. But if the couple or the woman does not want to keep it, then we celebrate their abortion in order to allow them to get on with their life at the cost of another life. So you're seeing what's happening here. We're deciding issues of life and termination of life based on convenience. I'm saying culture cannot have it both ways. If the zygote embryo or fetus is a life worth celebrating in one instance, it cannot be an inconvenience to be discarded in another. This is a pro-life argument from common sense. If we just look at the way our culture is dealing with pregnancies, whether it is with their friends or family or whether it is with celebrities, we are deciding not based on facts, not based on science, not based on, on the technology that allows us to know there is in fact human life inside of the womb. We're deciding it based on convenience. And Dune chapter two made this very abundantly clear to us. Now, this is a sci-fi movie. And so, you know, there are science fiction things going on. But what was clear was this tiny little unformed zygote had a massive future. And it's a future in the franchise. And it's a future in the leadership of the planet. And this is something that we see in scripture in real life, recorded in ancient history. In Luke's gospel, he starts out in verse 15, prophesying about John the Baptist. He says, 
For John the Baptist will be great in the sight of the Lord. He'll never drink wine or beer and will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And this is a prophecy that comes to fruition just 26 verses later. It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Mary who was pregnant with Jesus, the baby leaped inside her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like what Dune did is make it very clear that if something happened to this little embryo, something was happening to Aaliyah, the future star of the film and the hope for the family. It made that abundantly clear. You cannot detach that little fetus to the visions of the future that you got of this young woman. It is the same person, the same DNA. And to end one would end the other. And the same is clear here in Luke chapter one, you have a meeting between a pregnant Mary who's pregnant with Jesus and her cousin, Elizabeth, who's pregnant with John the Baptist, both of them in very inconvenient situations, especially Mary. And if either of them were to terminate their pregnancies, it's not just that they would be terminating a fetus or an embryo, um, they would be ending the life of John the Baptist or they would be ending the life of Jesus Christ. Dune made that clear. And it's why I think that Dune chapter two was accidentally the most pro-life movie of the year. Joy Reid recently went to TikTok in order to express her great frustration with some of the narratives coming out around pro-life and pro-choice conversations, pushing couples to consider having more children. This is a, a common call, especially on the right side of politics, although there are many people who are in the center and some who are even on the left, who are just looking at the facts of birth rate and replacement rate and making these same calls. However, it is known as kind of a right facing issue where people are pushing and even trying to legislate incentives for people to grow their families and to have more children. And uh, suffice it to say, Joy Reid does not agree with that argument. Let's have a listen to some of her thoughts. Of 327 million people, why do we need more kids? So that is basically her thesis. We'll listen to it again. The United States has a population of north of 327 million people. Why do we need more kids? All right. So I want you to hear clearly her overarching thought. We already have over 300 million people. Why do we need more kids? Now, what you need to do after you initiate a thesis like that is you then need to start making points that support your thesis. Unfortunately, Joy Reid, who I think is, you know, she's going off the cuff. Typically, she's on a, a script and a teleprompter on her show on MSNBC. She's just putting up a TikTok video. She's kind of just shooting from the hip because what's going to happen is a series of non sequiturs that don't actually apply to the arguments being made by people who do push for the expansion of families, having more kids. Um, and just other kind of hot button political issues. We'll listen to a little of it I mean, regardless. Your party, Senator Tuberville, is the one screaming that 10 million immigrants, which I don't even know that that number even makes any sense because it doesn't, um, have streamed into the country since Joe Biden has been president. And you're claiming that that's too many people, that if more people come into the southern border, this is some sort of crisis because we, we've got too many people and we've got no more space and we can't afford more people. But now you're saying we need more kids? So this is a, a somewhat compelling argument um, if, if you don't think through her actual argument. So number one, it, it's just simply a category error. And th the next part of her argument is kind of just an ad hominem attack on Senator Tuberville and somehow trying to link him to racism and slavery in a way that seems uh, just on it, on the surface unfair. So we're not going to even touch that, but let's talk about this. So she says, we already have 327 million people and you're complaining that 10 million immigrants are coming in undocumented and that we don't have the resources to take care of them. So let's take this apart piece by piece. Number one, there's a massive category error here between the call for citizens of the United States across all, all races, all classes, uh, you know, all ethnicities, all backgrounds, all education levels, just a call, like the one thing that, that, that people are calling for is, you know, be a citizen of the United States or be like 
entering legally or whatever. So that's the actual call is, hey, in America, Americans need to be having more children. Now, that is a different issue than whether or not we should have a porous border that allows upwards of 10 million people to cross. Now, the number she is citing is uh, an estimate that by the end of Joe Biden's term, 10 million people will have crossed in undocumented, which is an actual estimate. We're already up to uh, north of 7 million people that we know have come across the border and been released into the interior. So this isn't about the border debate because hopefully you have some level of a nuanced vision there and it's fine to want boundaries because to have a country you need boundaries you should also have compassion for the people who are desperate and a lot of people are coming over because they're desperate and you should also feel strongly that people who are coming over for nefarious means and trafficking drugs and weapons and criminals into the country should be stopped and we should have an opportunity and laws in place to stop that and we should enforce the laws that are on the books so that's that's the whole border conversation which is a different conversation that she's trying to tie in and she's just making a category error which makes makes it a non sequitur my thesis is three or 27 million is too many people. And so you're, you're concerned about that, but you shouldn't be concerned about that because you're also mad 10 million people are, are coming in. Well, if, if the American population increased the birth rate to where we added 10 million people who were citizens of the country, then that's the conversation we're having. This is a different conversation. Now, what about her point that we already can't take care of the people that we have. This is another non sequitur that's attached to the first one. So it does logically follow, it just doesn't tie to the thesis. So the 10 million people who are coming in undocumented, they're not coming in typically with homes to live in or with jobs already secured. And so they often find themselves in difficult situations. And you do see border towns like Eagle Pass being overrun and the, the systems of the local governments being overrun. You do see Eric Adams, the of New York City saying that they are in an absolute crisis because they have an expectation to take care of the welfare of all people in their city, including people who are not American citizens. And so, yes, programs, systems, and structures are being overrun, but not because people who are established as families are propagating more children. I have three kids. If we added a fourth to our family, we would be fine. We would go into our budget. We would shift money around to make sure that we probably have more grocery money, a little bit less fun money for the weekends, and we would be fine. That's very different than someone entering with no plan, no job, and no infrastructure and able to, to support their life. And then you multiply that by about 10 million people. So what she is saying here is not just a bad argument where she never supports her thesis. It's also just wrong on the merits because there is in fact an issue. While we do have 327 million people in America, Americans are producing children below replacement rate, which is exactly what it sounds like. We are not having enough children to replace ourselves, which means we might have 327 million people in the country today, but in the next generation, we will have far fewer people in our country. And the generation preceding that, we will have even fewer people in our country unless we get at least at replacement rate or above replacement rate. This is a study that's out of Wharton. And here's the summary. The US population's total fertility rate is now approximately 1.7 births per female, which is below the replacement rate of 2.1 that is required for the US population not to shrink without increases in immigration. Women are delaying motherhood from the 2006 average range of 25 to 29 to the 30 to 34 range today. So people are having less children, 1.7 compared to 2.1 where we were at in about 2000. Nine and women are not having children until they're into their early 30s instead of in their mid 20s. Birth rates here's what it affects it affects the potential size of the workforce, GDP, debt, and other macroeconomic indicators. Demographers and economists measure fertility using several different measures. Each measure has its advantage depending on the research focus. This, this post reports fertility trends from 2006 through 2019 for several of the most prominent measures. And so just to say it and make it obvious, it takes two people to have a child. So in order to be at replacement rate, then we have to be having on average 
2.1 children for every childbearing female. That that keeps us slightly above replacement pl- replacement rate since the two people are creating 2.1 children. Now you can't have 0.1 children. That's why it is a statistic looking across all people. So this just doesn't add up to the facts. Her thesis, we have 327 million people. Why in the world do you want people to have more kids? Well, the simple fact of the matter is because we are below replacement rate, which means we are a dying country. Now we have a drug epidemic like we've never seen before. Almost 100,000 Americans are now being taken out by drugs. The leading cause is fentanyl, which again is coming primarily across the southern border. And so we have more people dying. Suicide rates are going up. At the same time, birth rates are going down, which means, Joy Reid, we are a dying country. That is exactly why people should be pushed to have more children. There are serious economic problems that we are saving up for our future as people are living longer, which means they have more years in retirement, which means they are relying on a government who has promised Social Security for them. And we're not replacing ourselves on the back end to have a workforce paying taxes in in order to create the Social Security net to pay the people who are retired and growing older and older because of scientific advancement. So we're living much older and yet we're still below replacement rate, it is a bit of a disaster. Now, there's a deeper reason, a reason that goes all the way back to the ancient wisdom of scripture. Here is the the real core of the issue. Actively dissuading couples from having children is taking aim directly at the heart of God's creation mandate. When God creates in the creation narrative in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, he gives what is called the creative mandate. And the creative mandate says in part, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. This is a call for people to come together, to leave their mother and father, to cling to their spouse as one flesh, and then to be fruitful together, which is a fruitful life, not just in producing offspring, but in living a life of purpose and living a life of meaning and contributing to the larger mission that God gave us in this world to multiply, which is specifically to bear offspring in order to fill the earth and subdue it. We just had a great sermon at Metachurch where I'm the lead pastor. Our our youth pastor, Tony Albano, came up and he talked about God's design for the family and how the family is supposed to be a multi-generational team that is on a mission together. And we don't see things this way. We live in a hyper-individualized world, a hyper-individualized world. And because of that, we think of ourselves first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. And then maybe we consider the needs of our family. And we believe that the job of parents, if we become parents, it is to set our children up just for individual success. And for most of human history, people followed God's model, which is that the family achieves success together. The family has a common mission together. And family gives you so much to live for. But in our world today, where you are the primary focus and you are in essence, God and King, then if you believe children will be inconvenient to your instant gratification right now, you won't even consider bringing children into this world. And instead you will sacrifice future lineage, sacrifice future success, sacrifice what comes from the pursuit of non-selfish desires and building into the life of someone else. The psalmist says, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. youth. Here's what family does. Family forces us to quell our natural, selfish, individualistic pursuits. This is why our current culture rejects the family institution more and more all the time because it calls us out of the me and into the we that we were created to live in. Family teaches us how to sacrifice for the future. Our culture tells us to live to find instant gratification right here and right now. Joy Reid does not have a biblical framework for viewing the world. She has a very individualistic, modern framework that she is working out of, which is why she can ask what is both scientifically and statistically and philosophically an absurd question, which is why would we ever want people to have more kids. God says, be fruitful, multiply, 
fill the earth and subdue it. And as we walk away from the truths of God, we walk ourselves into disaster. We now have created through individualistic selfish pursuits, a country that is dying and dying faster and faster every day. So either we can turn back to those ancient truths and lean on them and we can uplift the idea and the model of family and we can learn how to build something that is bigger than ourselves or we will stay on our current course and watch as our country collapses around us. A huge controversy has sparked conversation around the country right now over the use of IVF. IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, is a fertility process that helps couples specifically who are struggling to get pregnant. And it takes pregnancy and procreation out of more of the natural act of intercourse between a man and a woman, and it takes it into a scientific direction where through the miracles of technology, to put this simply, and just so you know, I am not a scientist. Wow. So um, this is this is my version of this, right? If you're a scientist, tell me all the things I'm wrong about in the comments. Um, but healthy eggs are harvested from the woman, harvested, probably the wrong word, it's word that I'm going to use. Um, and then sperm is collected from the man, and the sperm is, is combined with the egg in a laboratory setting to create, conceive, literally this is the moment of conception, to conceive an embryo. And the healthy embryo is then implanted back into the woman. And so what's the problem, right? Because it, it's like, you know, I have some trouble with my eyes and so I wear glasses. So that's a technological advancement. Are we saying all technology is bad? We shouldn't use technology that is helpful, right? That, that's gonna be part of the, the argument. And here, here's the actual problem. And the issue that people who land on the pro-life side of things, which is a, a, a majority of people who are Christians, that is typically a Christian position is to be pro-life. Here's the problem people have with it. You can't guarantee that every egg harvested is going to be able to sustain the embryonic state. So in order to hedge your bets, you harvest as many eggs as you can. And typically men can produce an enormous amount of sperm. And so you, you just create as many embryos as possible to hedge your bets and have the best shot at one day delivering a healthy child, which means you might be able to create seven embryos. You might be able to create 17 embryos. It just kind of depends on the, the fertility health of each of the individuals involved in the process. So the obvious problem becomes if you produce 17 embryos and you're not planning on having 17 children, then what happens to all of these other embryos who have been conceived? And the big question comes down to, is that embryo an actual human life? Is it recognized by humanity, by science, and by God as human life? So this is a, a deep and abiding question, and it's a question that now people are really having to wrestle with. What happened is the Alabama Supreme Court held true to its definition of life, that life happens at the moment of conception. And because of that, it sees every embryo that is created in the IVF process, most of which are frozen until they're ready to be used, all of those as life and deserving of equal protection under the Alabama state law, which means they cannot be disposed of. And this is what often happens is, if you have an embryo or two that you successfully bring to term, then the rest of them often are discarded or people choose to freeze them for a later date. But oftentimes now you have one kid or two kids and you just don't get back to them. At the same time, IVF for most people is an insanely expensive process. And so you want to hedge your bets and give yourself the best shot possible. And so we see politicians, especially on the right, having a very hard time deciding what their position is on this because they are boldly pro-life in almost every stance, but they're being pressed on this issue from the left and they're not exactly sure how to stand their ground. For an example, here is Governor Grab, uh, Greg Abbott uh, of my home state of Texas. We want to make it easier. Uh, for people to be able to have babies, not, not make it harder. Uh, and the IVF process is a way of giving life uh, to even more babies. Uh, and so what, what I think the goal is, uh, is to, to make sure uh, that we can find a pathway uh, to ensure that parents who otherwise may not have the opportunity to have a child will be able to have access to the IVF process and become parents and give life to babies. Uh, and 
because this is a relatively new issue, we're just going to find ways to uh, navigate uh, laws mm -hmm. and fact situations that are very complicated. Well, let me ask. And so uh, Greg Abbott is speaking to the heart of the issue right now. Um, I, I have had many people I am very close to struggle with fertility. And it is one of the most unique experiences of suffering that I've ever observed. This deep desire to expand your family and to bring life into the world Um and then for that not, something you almost assume you're going to be able to do, right? It's just this natural thing that everyone has done forever. And then for that not to pan out and to try all of the different things and all of the options and to just be on, on your knees begging God and praying and not to be able to conceive, I'm telling you, it is a uniquely painful experience. And Governor Abbott is speaking to our need to increase the number of children that we're having in our families because we are a dying country below re replacement rate. However, he's using the word life in this instance. We want people to be able to bring life and he's going to continue to use life in a way that is typically used by pro-choice people in the abortion argument. And yet he's using it here in the IVF argument. And this is why this has become a very, very complex political conversation, not to mention that it is an extremely, even beyond that complex, ethical conversation. About your state, uh, Texas has one of the strictest anti-abortion laws in the country. Are you saying that families in Texas who are using IVF have extra embryo embryos that are frozen, do not need to worry? Well, so you raise fact questions uh, that, that are complex that I simply don't know the answer to. Let me give you a couple of uh, examples, and that is, uh, I have no idea mathematically the, the, the number of frozen embryos. Is it, is it one, 10, 100, 1,000? Uh, things like that matter. What I, what I don't know is uh, families who may have frozen embryos, what happens if they were done so that a mother could uh, have a pregnancy, but uh, after those embryos were frozen, the mother passes away? What happens mm -hmm. then? Uh, what happens if after the embryos are frozen, the, uh, the, the mother uh, mm -hmm. and, and the husband, uh, they get a divorce? Here, here's my point in telling you that, uh, Dana, and that is, these are very complex issues where I'm not sure everybody has really thought about uh, what all the potential problems are. And as, as a result, uh, no one really knows what the potential yeah. answers are. And I think you're going you're gonna to see states across the entire country coming together and grappling with these issues. So, again, she is pressing him from the political left on this, saying, Governor Abbott, you have one of the most pro-life states in all of America. You are a pro-life leader. So are you saying that these embryos – and here's the subtext – which you say when an embryo is in utero must be protected at all cost without exception. Are you saying that these embryos that are now frozen, people are going to be protected if they do something like discard them after a certain number of years? And he starts making arguments that I just think for pro-life people are going to circle all the way back around to then bite them in the butt. Wow. He says, well, there's a lot of questions like, is it one embryo? Or is it 10,000 embryos? Here's the question if you're pro-life. Are you okay with making the argument, I'm not going to have 10,000 abortions. I'm just going to have one abortion. So does the quantity of potential lives that may be lost matter to the legislation of this? Or is it about the quality or what we would often say in the pro-life side, the sanctity of every single individual life? He then starts bringing up some scenarios what if there's a dozen frozen eggs and the mother dies? That's a good question to ask. What if there's a dozen frozen embryos and there's a divorce? And now, now what's going to happen? And so he's saying, we don't really know this and we don't know the ethics of it and we don't know how to respond to it. And so for now, we're just going to protect it and make sure people can do it. I just want to point out that this is very, very different in how we approach every other medical ethical issue. So if there is some kind of new procedure and we're just not sure whether or not it will end with the person under the procedure dying a high percentage of the time, guess what? We don't do that procedure. We go through years of testing and ethical debates and then decide whether or not it's worth to run that risk and in what scenarios it's worth running that risk. But here we seem to be reversing that. And I believe it's because this would be a highly politically losing stance to make a hard line against something like this. Let me be completely transparent. Um, 
our family God put together in a very unique way. And so I really am out of the loop historically in my own life on fertility, fertility treatments. I had no idea what IVF was until pretty recently when this has become a conversation out in the ether. And when it became a real conversation and people had questions about it in my own congregation where I pastor, I had to educate myself on it. And what I strive to do in life is to be intellectually honest and to be philosophically consistent. And so this does come down to a question of life. I want to take you through just to help you. If you are a Christian, to help you think through a biblical model to be philosophically consistent in IVF, which is becoming a very hot topic in our world today. And then we'll try to land with some conclusive thoughts. Number one, throughout the whole council of scripture, God always prioritizes life as the first blessing that leads to all other blessings. This is so obvious, it almost goes without saying, but scripture does say it like over and over and over again. The Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils and the man became a living being. You must be alive to come under all the other rights and blessings that life affords you. In Deuteronomy 13, God said, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. So choose life so that you and your descendants may live. And so the, the first question is, when does human life actually begin? Let's look at this biblically. In Jeremiah 1, God says, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born and I appointed you a prophet to the nations. In Psalm 139, 13, uh, King David cries out for, it was you, God, who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. From a biblical perspective, uh, life begins at, at the moment of conception, at the latest, like God, who is at the end and the beginning, the alpha and the omega knows you before you're even conceived is what scripture reveals from both the prophetic, the prophetic and the poetic standpoint. What about from a scientific standpoint, from a scientific perspective, human life begins at fertilization when the sperm and egg unite to form a unique DNA structure. And you need to know this is not even remotely scientifically controversial. Most people are sheltered from the scientific realities of conception and life because of the immensely large influence of pro-choice in the pro-choice movement. However, from a scientific perspective, human life begins at fertilization. At fertilization, when the sperm and egg combine, a unique set of DNA is formed. This DNA contains the complete genetic information that will determine the individual's physical and biological characteristics. This genetic uniqueness is a defining feature of a new human life. If you were to go to one of those embryos and take a DNA sample from them, they would have the same DNA that you would find if they took a 23andMe DNA test 75 years later. That is the code of life, and that code of life is consistent from the moment of fertilization. This fertilized egg, known as a zygote, begins a process of rapid cell division and development that ultimately leads to a fully developed human being. The zygote is distinct from both the sperm and egg and represents the beginning of a brand new, genetically unique human organism. At fertilization, the zygote possesses biological attributes that are characteristic of living organisms. It exhibits metabolism, growth, responsiveness to stimuli, and the ability to undergo cellular division, which are all harm hallmarks of life the moment of conception a baby becomes life the dna of that zygote is set whether they will be tall or short blonde or brunette have curly hair straight hair or male pa pattern baldness all of that genetic information is there from the very very start which means at any and every stage of development both scripture our guiding authority as christians and science say that the answer to whether or not at the moment of conception, life exists is resoundingly yes. And so we have the scriptural basis and we have the scientific basis. What about the philosophical basis? Because this comes down to a question of rights. And this is how it's talked about. And typically on the pro-choice side, you have people who are standing up for the rights of the woman or the rights of the couple as the first right to be prioritized. And on the pro-life side, you have the rights of the baby being prioritized. What does that break down to? 
it breaks down on the pro-choice side to the rights of liberty, the liberty to make a decision about your own body, the liberty to move forward in your life unencumbered by a child, which is a huge social and economic burden. On the pro-life side, you're talking about, it's right in the name, issues of life. Now, we have enumerated in our Declaration of Independence rights that are given to us, not by the government, but by God himself. And those are the rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And when you look at those rights, those are not co-equal rights. Those were understood by the founders as concentric rights which is an idea derived straight from scripture because remember God prioritizes life as the first blessing that leads to all other blessings. Well, our constitutional groundwork sees the right of life as the primary and first right that leads to liberty and liberty leads to the ability to pursue a life of happiness and purpose. And so you have competing rights on the pro-life side, the right of life, on the pro-choice side, the right of liberty. And so which right should be prioritized, the life of the baby or the liberty of the couple? What we see philosophically is that the right to life must come first. It is the right that leads to all other rights. If you are not alive, you don't have other rights. And so the ultimate question is, is it a life? The ultimate question regarding IVF is whether you are ultimately just discarding an embryo or if you are ending somebody's life. What's interesting politically is right now, many people on the right are actually pushing for the progressive argument saying that the liberty of couples trumps the potential right of life. And so how do we think about this as Christians? We should not be afraid of technological advancement. We should not be afraid of scientific endeavor. We should use those things to our advantage, which is part of what I'm trying to do by having a podcast that takes current issues and views them through the ancient wisdom of scripture. This is all technology that I'm using here. My little webcam here, that's not very nice. My microphone and soundboard, it's all technology and I'm trying to use it for good means. However, we also should be ethically, theologically, and morally consistent in how we think about things. And if the process of in vitro fertilization is creating life, and again, both scientifically and theologically and philosophically, the moment of fertilization is conception and what is conceived is a human life. By every definition, and that's not scientifically controversial, it's why we're having this conversation. So is there an ethical way to have IVF as a part of your the expansion of your family? I think there is. However, it is not typically how people would approach IVF, and here's why. The ethical and consistent way as someone who is a Christian or someone who is pro-life to go about IVF is to make a commitment that for every egg that is fertilized, for every embryo created, you will bring it to term. There's a couple ways to do that. Either you allow a cap on the number of eggs that you allow to be harvested, which if you have eight and they all are fertilized and not every fertilized egg takes and creates an embryo. That's why in IVF, they try to get as many out as possible because you're hedging your bets in what is often a, you know, 15 to $40,000 procedure for people. You don't want to pay $30,000 and only take two shots at this thing and neither of them work out. And so people harvest as many eggs as possible and try to, so you either say, we're, we're about to potentially have a freaking massive family. Like we're about to have to get a, a F-350 Ford band van and roll around like the Partridge family because any embryo that comes out of this, over time, we're taking to term. That's one ethical option. The other ethical option is very dangerous monetarily. And unless you're just made of money, it's going to be a hard decision, which is we're going to put a very small cap. You know, we, we're thinking about having three to four kids. And so we're going to allow four eggs to, to be. And man, these are very, very difficult decisions. And look, when you read across the beginnings of the church and the church fathers, there's a lot of conversations. This is primarily a pre-scientific world about when a baby in utero has a soul and when a life begins and, and all of these things. However, here's what I'd say, knowing the facts of what scripture tells about life and knowing the facts around the process of in vitro fertilization, 
if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God lives inside of you, and you need to be paying attention to the promptings and conviction of the Holy Spirit. You need to be following those convictions. I do think there is an ethical way at this, but I do think we should be very, very hesitant to become inconsistent in our theology and morality based on the convenience of our situation or even the deep, deep suffering of our situation. And I also think that knowledge matters. And you see Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, and one of the things he tells them is that it is their knowledge that condemns them. And so potentially you've been through this process already, and maybe God has blessed you with children through this process, and you should thank God for those children. And maybe you just didn't really understand all of the steps involved or the ethical implications of it. And we'll be held accountable for the knowledge that we have. And at the same time, we should be pursuing knowledge and in the word and seeing how God guides us on these difficult conversations. And so I'd love to hear in the comments, maybe how you as a Christian think through this process. And maybe you're seeing something I don't, or you know something in the science of it that I don't, that could change uh, an opinion or maybe give a new perspective. This is a conversation though, at the bottom line that I think as believers, and especially if you are pro-life, that you need to be ready to have, that we should be ready in season and out of season to give a reason for the faith that we have as believers. I want to thank you for tuning into episode 52 of the Clayton Tyner podcast. Don't forget to subscribe. We're in the 900s. We're growing every week. All we got to do is put a comma in it. A thousand has been a goal for a while. Um, it's a big benchmark to get to those four digits. And so tell your friends, like, comment, hit the notification bell. And if you want to get exclusive access to content early access to interviews, there's going to be one going up on the Patreon this week. Also, live Q and A's once a month, go to patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. The link is in the description. I'd love for you to join the Patreon. We get to know each other a lot better there. We actually get to talk to each other instead of you just hearing from me through a screen. And if you hate the soundboard, there's no soundboard in the Patreon Q and A. So that's the perfect place for you. So patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. I really appreciate the support. I love you guys and I'll see you on episode 53.